The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this Advice Cloud and Crown Commercial Services Technology Services for Update and Top Tips um, webinar. I'm delighted to welcome you here. We are taking the longer format this morning due to having our, um, our lovely uh, guests and friends from Crown Commercial to talk through the um, application process and the timeline and things like that. But um, so we're here for an hour. There's going to be um, a bit of housekeeping. So the is being recorded right now, and the audio and the slides and question and answers will be disseminated probably by tomorrow afternoon. Box. We need to just check all the answers that we give and make sure that CCS are happy with the stuff that gets out as well. And also, um, if you do have questions, please use your sidebar questions. Don't use the chat if you can. Try to use the questions there and any that we can't answer, we would do our best to get them answered and put into a QA and a spreadsheet, which again, we'll send out tomorrow, um, all being well, okay? Um, so yeah, really, really delighted to be here today. This is an extraordinarily important um, framework, we think, for, for public sector and uh, for suppliers as well. So there'll be some, hopefully some very useful information. It would help if I had my keyboard in front of me, wouldn't it? Luckily, you can't see me on this one, so my camera's off. So here we go, let's um, move on. So on the agenda, so we'll do a quick, quick introductions to Advice Cloud, and then um, we'll talk about why you should consider this framework, whether it's right for you or not. Then we'll hand over to um, Crown Commercial to talk about the updates on um, Technology Services 4 and the timelines and application process. We'll then talk through some top tips about being a successful um, supplier on or through application and then being a successful supplier on the framework itself. A little bit of a pitch from us about how we can help. And then we'll mark the adjustments with the Q&A. So we're going to take about 15 to 20 minutes again for Q&A all being well. Uh, and, you know, as I say, everything will be, we're trying to answer your questions as much as possible. So a quick intro to us, if you don't know who we are, um, we are a, a procurement government, GovTech procurement company. Um, we can sell sort of the world's only GovTech viability mentors and public sector procurement experts. We do like to work with both suppliers and buyers. Okay, we found it's our 10th birthday, I think. Uh, like October the 1st is we're actually 10. I can't believe we're actually here. So, um, uh, you know, it's, it's been a great journey. And so far, we've supported over 500 clients, um, of which 72% of those are SMEs, and they've all learned about, a, a, cumulatively across a few frameworks, over a billion and a half as a direct result of our work. So, you know, we do think we've got something really useful to add to the mix in this. Um, so, Danny, we're going to run a quick poll first, please, just to gauge the temperature of the room. Can I ask you to do that? And just everyone, well, we will be running these just, um, just to help us move things along and understand the market a little bit better. So, the first question we're asking is, are you listed on Tech Services 3? And we've got five answers there. Yes, and we won business. Yes, but we haven't won any business. No, we applied, didn't get on. No, we missed the application. And no, we need to the framework. Okay, we've got seventy-six percent voted. Remember, advice cloud and CCS peeps not not advisable for you to um, to to uh, be voting on this if you don't mind. Up to eighty-two percent. Now, give it a couple more seconds, and then we'll um, and then we'll uh, close that off and publish the results. Okay, Danny, if you wouldn't mind closing that down now, we'll publish the results on that. Okay, so um, so there's. 65% of you um, are brand new to the framework. Well, that's really interesting. Thank you very much for that. And it's good to see that 22% of people have actually won some this have actually won some business for it as well. So welcome to you. Hopefully you'll find this webinar really of use. If you close that down, Danny, we can crack on. Okay, bear with me a second. Do that. There we go. So why should you consider your framework? What do you need to know about it? And I'm just going to move my sidebar there so I can actually see my whole screen. So there we are. So what is the technology services framework for? It's probably, I think that from a, uh, from a public sector perspective, it's probably one of the largest frameworks out there for you know, traditional technology services. So the IT services market, 
it's um, you know, so you've got technology strategy, service design, a lot around operational deployment. So you know, for fairly big scale stuff. Although, you know, we do see some fairly discreet um, procurements coming out of that as well. It uh, does have scope for lots of larger scale projects. And, you know, it's much more room for you know, there's things like cheaper you can get in this. There's larger scale, longer term contracts. You can actually do a bit more on the risk sharing rather than you would be able to do on the DOS and the, and the G Cloud frameworks. Um, it does expire in June 2025, and that has used up all the traditionally illegally available extensions available, but there's always room for emergency should they ever need to. Um, and, you know, we've said we've had this ISMS for a while now, and it's always one of the bigger ones. We think. It's kind of one of those ones we call a major framework, uh, and certainly I think one of the most important ones in Crown Commercial Services um, portfolio. This is for the spend here. Now, this is actually from contract awards data from Tuscal, okay? So as a, for those who don't know the difference, contract award data is what's published about the total con what the potential code, total contract value is. You will see later on potentially that, um, that there are the spend figures for TS3 are less because that, that's usually done on what's actually been invoiced through the framework, okay? So, I mean, TS3 has done some fantastic value. Okay, the, the ceiling value was around two billion. We've done nearly five billion pounds in our contract awards. There's 400 identified call offset. All of this has come from Tussle based on um, contract awards, the publicly available contract award data. All right, so it is a, a, in our world a very, very major and very useful framework to anyone looking to supply these types of services into the public sector. So who's buying? Okay, so as you can see, HMRC are absolutely crushing it here. They've got, they've got a lot to do and they've had a lot of work to do over this period of time, as well as Home Office and the mod. Uh, you know, the vast majority is the central government, but you are seeing um, healthcare as well. I mean, you've got these, these are in the hundreds of millions of pounds. You do get wider public sector um, out there as well, use it. And again, this bear in mind that this is um, all based on contract. A lot of contracts that are awarded they won't they may not reference the framework um, especially in the wider public sector um you know there's just sometimes when they're when it either doesn't get put on contracts award or contract finder which is a bit naughty um or you know it doesn't really reference the framework as that's what they've used to actually do the contract um so i'm delighted now to hand over to our friends um, at crown commercial services we've got Aggie and Ethan from the Crown Commercial Services team. Oh, oh, can you hear me in uh, in, in true? Um, oh, I've forgotten what that program is now. Uh, Eurovi Euro Eurovision style. <laughs> um, thank you very much. We can hear you, and I'm just. I think everybody can hear me, hopefully, and I know you how to navigate. Go to clear, because we've had a bit of an issue. Lovely. So thank you very much for having us. I'm Aggie Taylor. I'm a commercial lead in technology services category in Crown Commercial, and I'm the procurement lead for technology services for, and I'm joined today by Ethan. So Ethan, I will let you introduce yourself. Uh, thank you. Yeah, my name's Ethan Harrison. I've been working in CCS for three and a half years now, and um, I'm working on all things TS4, helping to deliver the framework. Thanks. We're delighted for you to be Thank here. You, and you just, if you just let me know when you want me to push the slides on, I'll do so. Oh, yes, please. If we can move on to the first slide, that would be great. So again, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's great to be able to reach to such a broad range of suppliers, providers and future providers. I think the number or the percentage of suppliers that are not currently on CSD was quite high when it comes to the poll, which is really interesting. So. Today we'll talk about all things technology services for, and we will mention technology services three, which I think is quite important, just to give you a bit of continuity and overview. So the agenda is very simple. We try to keep it simple. I think we've got about half an hour, so I will try my best to keep up with the pace that um, Chris and the team have um, shown this morning. And um, please do let me know if, if we need to pick up the pace from time to time, because we can talk about technology services for all day. I appreciate that we've got a limited time window here. So we, before we move on to technology services three and four overview, just wanted to give you an idea of the timescales that we are working to. We started our market or pre-market engagement in September last year. And whilst traditionally we would have stopped talking to you in March, April, after the pre-market engagement, we have continued to speak to the market, we've continued to engage with the buyers and suppliers 
there's a lot of changes, there's a lot going on. I think it's really important to keep the conversation going. So we are now in the ITT preparation phase, which is really intense for us. We are in the middle of doing the ITT pack, the evaluation, the terms and conditions, making sure that we understand exactly what's happening in the world of you know, the procurement regulations act and how that's going to impact everything else. So all of that is very much um, helping us to work in a bit more of an agile kind of a way. So we're still planning to release the ITT at the end of October, which I still believe is the date for the new procurement act to go live. I think it's still 28th of October. So if anything changes, we will absolutely let you know. And this is all in preparation for technology services for go live, which we're hoping to be in quarter two 2025 in preparation for technology services three expiry, which is June next year, as Chris would have already mentioned. Can we go to the next slide, please? Just to give you an idea of the engagement we've had to date, so we've tried really hard to speak to as many suppliers and as many buyers we could, especially in the pre-market engagement phase, which is really important because it informs our thinking. It helps us to design a better product. It helps us to make sure that we understand the different voices from the market, the supply base, the buyers and everybody in between. Um, the regulations, we've spoken to all of the stakeholders that we needed to consult as well. So. I think, Ethan, please to keep me honest here, we've spoken to over 500 different suppliers, whether that was via the webinars. Uh, we've had six supplier surgeries and we continue to do these surgeries. I think we'll have two left. We had an SME webinar. We continue talking to suppliers on a one to one basis as well. We've engaged lots and lots of buyers. We were working closely with a number of buyers across the wider public sector and the central government just to make sure that what we are proposing makes sense, that we can stress test it. We also had um, two big in-person events in London and Manchester. For those that have attended, thank you very much. I think we've got a, one more event planned in London and Ethan will talk about that in a bit. So this is the overview of the engagement to date. We will continue talking to you, hopefully, until the ITT goes live and just making sure that our supply base is as informed as possible. Next slide, please. Thank you. Well, I don't have to say it anymore. Fantastic. So just to give you an overview of Technology Services 3, which is our existing framework, it's one of the largest frameworks in CTS and perhaps in the public sector when it comes to technology services. It's due to expire in June next year. It's got a range of different services, but it very much focuses on the IT service lifecycle from strategy to um, live service management. And it's the only framework in CCS which offers this kind of breadth of technology services. CS4 is going to follow suit and it's also going to have a quite broad and flexible specification to allow for that to happen. At the moment, the supply base is showing us 239 suppliers, out of which about 125 are classed as SMEs. So um, we have a really good SME base when it comes to technology services three, and we are hoping to have the same for technology services four. So again, the spend that we're showing here is based on our data, as Chris mentioned before, we tend to track in a slightly different way. So the spend is showing us two billion pounds, which is really, which has really picked up when it comes to comparison to other frameworks or technology services two or the previous iteration. The framework has proved really popular, especially in the central government. So we have a lot of central government buyers, but we have also seen an uptake from the wider public sector buyers. And we are trying very hard to ensure that technology services for is going to be suitable for all buyers with a level of flexibility that is required in order for that to happen. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to go too much into detail when it comes to technology services three, lot structure, all documents when it comes to technology services three are available online on the CCS website. But just to give you an idea, TS3 has got five lots at the moment. We've got three, oh sorry, we've got four operational lots, which is 3A to 3D. And you would see that it follows the IT services lifecycle. So lot number one is technology strategy and design. Then you've got transition transformation, live services management. Then you've got the major service transformation programs, which is very much reserved for the very big, complex, very high value and complexity kind of programs. And lot five is service integration and management. So I'm telling you this because we'll be talking now, thank you, about technology services for lotting structure. 
So after considering all of the feedback that we had from the market and the changes that we needed to deliver as well, we've landed on this lotting structure. You would see that lot two, for example, is now a consolidation of what was lot two and five in technology services three. So that includes transition and SIAM. Um, lot five in technology services three is one of the, I suppose, less popular lots. I think a lot of SIAM services would have been procured via other lots. So we've made a decision to not to reintroduce a standalone SIAM lot and instead make sure that there's continuity for the buyers and suppliers, bringing, in, bringing it into lot two, sorry. Um, one of the other changes you would see is that um, the operational lots will look a little bit different. So we have again consolidated lot 3A and 3B into end user services and infrastructure and management services. So now we have the front end, the back end and the application and data management services, which I still think is our biggest lot at the moment on technology services three. But one of the key changes that we really want to introduce based on the market feedback we've had is the introduction of the lower value and complexity lots. So those will be mirror lots for the lot three, lot four and lot five. They will have the same specification, but slightly different minimum and maximum call of value. That is yet to be decided. So these lots are meant to lower the barriers to entry to allow a group of suppliers to get onto the framework where otherwise maybe they wouldn't have been able to achieve that. We will have a lower quality threshold, there will be silver FVRA rather than gold. And there will be other considerations in place that we will be able to talk you through, hopefully on the 19th of September in how to bid session. Uh, when it comes to other really important things we needed to mention is that there's no restriction on supply numbers when it comes to technology services for, so the lots will not be capped and that is going to be an open procedure as well. Um, another thing that's worth mentioning here is the fact that we've tried very hard to make sure that there will be an approach available to buyers for the lower value and complexity kind of requirements where speed to market might be key, where the complexity of the terms and conditions will be slightly reduced or we will be able to help them to navigate it a little bit quicker and a little bit better. So these are the kind of key things that are coming from the market and this is how we're looking to facilitate it. And um, just to mention that now, there will be no maximum call off term or minimum call off term. This is one of the other changes from Technology Services 3. At the moment, there are different maximum term per lot. We're looking to remove that because um, one of the things that the buyers were really keen to see is for them to be able to decide what that's going to look like. So this is what we're proposing as well. Next slide, please. OK, so just to give you an overview in terms of what technology services for is going to look like after months and months of talking to the market, market consultation, um, internal approvals, going through the processes, making sure that we understand what can be introduced as part of PPA 2023, which are the new procurement regulations, how that would benefit our buyers and suppliers as well, making things easier and more flexible. A decision has been made to launch technology services for as an open framework. So traditionally speaking, if we were to choose a, a normal framework or a closed framework, what we like to call them now, we would have to introduce it as a four year term kind of a framework. Launching it as an open framework, however, however, sorry, gives us the opportunity to extend the term. So the framework is going to live for eight years. We're also going to reopen the framework twice in year three and year five, which will allow new suppliers to join the framework. So the process will be the same. And for those that haven't had the chance, please do familiarize yourselves with the new procurement regulations, especially the guidance around frameworks. Um, and Yes, there's, there's a lot of documents available, but if you're really interested in bidding on some of the frameworks that are coming out very early, like Technology Services 4, please do have a look at the documentation and if you haven't done so, do familiarise yourselves. It hopefully will make things a bit easier to understand. So again, when it comes to key changes, um, Technology Services 4 will be a £16 billion kind of a framework or FTS, what used to be OJU. 
And that's due to the fact that it will have to cover the full life cycle of the framework. And given that there's no maximum call off term, it will have to cover all of the call offs that potentially will be approved on the last year or even the last day of the framework. So that's why we've put that as 16 billion pounds. When it comes to scope, we're looking to, it's, we've mentioned this before and it's not, um, it's an evolution rather than a revolution. So we're looking to improve it. After consulting the market, there were some key themes that we've picked up on, which is make sure that you are future proofing the framework by introducing things like AI and automation. We are going to introduce that, but just to let you know, it's not going to be available as a standalone kind of a service. It will be an ancillary and mainly to allow the suppliers to drive optimization and deliver benefits when it comes to services that can be del delivered with the help and the use of this kind of technology. So it will be acting as a facilitator and an ancillary kind of a service rather than standalone kind of a proposition. So all of this will be captured in the terms and conditions as well. And we're also looking to improve the clarity of our offering, which is making sure that it is well understood what the framework is appropriate for, or sorry, what you will be appropriate for, versus what it will not be appropriate for and what are the routes to market the buyers should be considering. The framework structure we talked about, so I'm not going to talk about it again in here. When it comes to call off mechanisms, we are really hoping to retain the same level of flexibility that we currently have on CS3 because our buyers uh, were very keen for us to do so. And that's the kind of main feedback we were getting from the, from the buyer engagement that we've done. But one of the key changes that um, PPA 2023 allows us to do is the incorporation of competitive flexible procedure into further competition. So multi-stage procurements. And TS4 is going to allow that. We will be able to include things like, or sorry, the buyers will be able to include things like the proof of concept, proof of value, discovery, negotiation so all of those things that we weren't able to do previously in vast majority of our frameworks so please do have a look at uh, conditions of participation as well when it comes to supporting documents and the guidance that has been released by the cabinet office and other sources because that will help you to understand what is changing in this space as well so when it comes to the ray card ethan will talk you through that in a bit so i'm not going to steal his thunder here and terms and conditions, we will mention that as well. But one of the key things to, to really mention when it comes to terms and conditions is that we've asked a lot of questions, and thank you very much for those that helped us to get to this point, about what needs to change. And one of the key things that we really need to change is making sure that there is a way for the buyers to buy things a bit quicker than what they can currently do under Technology Services 3, and to reduce the level of complexity that we've got in TS3. Um, which is predominantly driven by the fact that we've got three different call-off terms. So we're working very hard with uh, the government legal department and our solicitors to make sure that we can simplify it as much as possible. Okay, so when it comes to the bidding process, um, I've mentioned that we are still looking at going live with the ITT as soon as the regulations would go live and um, we will be able to launch the ITT. So when it comes to the procedure, it will be an open procedure and all UK registered suppliers will be able to bid for a place on the framework. The bidding timescales will be very similar to what we have at the moment, I think, or what we would have been doing, which is 30 days. And um, when it comes to the lower value and complexity lots, these will be treated a little bit differently because, again, we are trying to lower the barriers to entry. However, when it comes to the process, um, we will be looking to use the same questions for both lots. However, we will be changing the quality threshold just to make sure that we can streamline the process and the suppliers would only have to bid once. For example, we have done a session or even a couple of sessions, I think, when it comes to supplier surgery. So if you wanted to go back and have a look at that, please feel free to do so. That's uh, I think the recordings are available on Tech UK. Um, and Ethan will be able to put the links in the chat if necessary. There's a lot of information available, but I think just to emphasise, uh, we will be looking to engage all of the suppliers at the end of October 
all supplies that want to bid for the framework can. There's no capping of the lot, so we're not restricting the number of suppliers. And we are lowering the barriers to entry when it comes to the lower value and complexity lots, just to make sure that we will have a robust supply base. And next slide, please. Okay, so um, I will hand you over to Ethan now, who will talk you through what we've done with TS4 rate card. Thanks, Aggie. Um, so for TS4, we've decided to move away from a supplier-led rate card towards a, a DA, DP, CF, or as it used to be known, DDAT led rate card. So to briefly explain the, the DDAT framework, um, it has seven different job families, which you can see on the left-hand side of the screen there, so architecture, data, and so on. Um, and each job family within it has different job roles, as you can see on, on the right-hand side. So within architecture, there's business architect, data architect, and so on. Um, so then within each um, job role, there's then further job role levels. So within business architect, there is... Um, junior, associate, then just business architect and lead business architect as well. Um, so using the DDAP website and working with our cabinet office colleagues, we've mapped each role level to a Sapphire level. So, so that um, although being DDAP led, our rate card will still incorporate Sapphire as well. Um, so in the TS4 rate card, we'll be asking for prices on a job family basis, asking that you provide a maximum rate for each supplier level for each job family. So this, the picture on the left is how the rate card will look. Um, the maximum rate provided for each supplier level will be the maximum rate that can be charged for all DDAT role levels that come under that supplier level within that job family. Um, in order to ensure that all possible services that can be procured through TS4 are available in the rate card, we've also added in two extra job families in the form of cybersecurity and program management. So these aren't available through the DDAP framework, but these services can be purchased um, in, under the tech services agreement. So we've mapped them out accordingly. Um, the cybersecurity roles as well have been created in collaboration with the UK Cyber Security Council. So everything that could be needed has been covered in those roles as well. So we feel that this approach will reduce the burden upon application for suppliers because we'll only be requesting the rate card as seen on the left hand side of the screen. So rather than providing a different price for every single job role level in DDAP, which is what the rate card on the right would look like, you'll instead just be filling out the grid on the left with maximum rates. So instead of giving over 150 different prices, you'll just be filling out the, the one on the left instead. So it should be much faster at point of application. Uh, Sapphire levels one and seven as well can be provided, but they are optional, so they will not be evaluated. And it's the same with nearshore and offshore rates as well. These can also be provided in a separate rate card, but won't be evaluated um, on your application to the framework. So it, it's important to note before moving on that although um, we're only asking for the rate card on the left to be filled in, buyers are call off level can ask or will ask for a, a full breakdown of costs. So the purpose of this is just to ease up, but ease the burden on suppliers during application, but you, you will have to provide a full breakdown of prices per role level for each um, call off contract on the agreement. We, we'll also ask for this data in our MI collection as well, which is, which is the current process we use on TS3 as well. Uh, that's everything for, for that slide. If you can move on, please. Thank you, Ethan. I also just wanted to add that we spent quite some time talking about the way card. We appreciate that it's really important in terms of how you're going to price your services up. And one of the reasons why we selected the job family level maximum day rates approach is so that um, 
the suppliers will be able to use new and emerging roles that will be added by the DDAT team in the future. So we will not be restricted and the buyers and yourselves, you will not be restricted to the roles available at the moment, which would have been the case had we used the, the other approach. So any kind of new roles, as long as it's within the maximum day rate, those will be incorporated. And we've also added cyber security roles and projects and program management, which are not currently available on DDAT, but they're very important and we appreciate that they form part of the overall specification and the service delivery. And obviously, cyber security is becoming a very important topic for everybody as well. So that's something that we've added in collaboration with, and Ethan, please remind me who we've spoken to to date. Um, for the for the cyber security roles, that's the cyber yes. security council. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So these roles uh, is not something that we've just um, we've come up with for the purpose of CS4. We've worked with other government departments just to make sure that these roles are representative of what the expectation would be within the market and the roles that will be required as part of this any kind of service services. Sorry, cyber services delivery. Um, so yes, thank you for that, Ethan. Um, if there's any questions around the rate card, we have done a session on that as for one hour recording that's available via Tech UK. We're more than happy to take questions at the end of the session. We appreciate that this is quite an important topic. But for now, um, let's move on to the terms and conditions. As part of the market engagement, we asked a lot of questions about terms and conditions when it comes to Technology Services 3. So Technology Services 3 contract and all of the contractual documents are available online. So for those that are preparing to potentially bid for Technology Services 4, my advice would be have a look at those, share them with your solicitors, with your legal people. It will give you an idea of what kind of terms we might be introducing in the future. So that would be my advice at the moment. Some of the key areas that we will be working and we have been working on is IPR, for example, liabilities, our suppliers were very keen for us to introduce more flexibility when it comes to termination for convenience. So just rather than introducing more flexibility, we're looking to um, introduce additional guidance as well to make sure that the buyers understand how to use those terms and how to drive benefits and how to potentially introduce termination for convenience so that it delivers most benefits and it reduces risk or the risk management aspects of that will be really important as well. We're looking to align the framework to the DDAP playbook. Again, the DDAP playbook is publicly available. It is something that technology frameworks would normally be aligned to, and that's what we are striving to do. Uh, simple terms for low value call offs, that is something we're working very hard to introduce for speed to market purposes, and also statements of work. Um, so the buyers, well, every single buyer we have spoken to was very keen for us to introduce statements of work because that's the way that they work at the moment. So that's something we're looking to add. That will be available for all of the lots on TS4. And that's something we'll be able to, or you'll be able to work with um, if you secure a place on Technology Services for Framework. Other things that I'm sure you will be very interested in is, is liabilities, insurances. So one thing I would say is that we've, we've had a lot of feedback about cyber um, insurance. That's something that we're working through. Um, I would like to assure you that we have taken that seriously and that we are taking steps to mitigate any potential impact on the supply base and we will be able to confirm um, our approach in the next, what well, the terms and conditions session that we will be launching shortly. Okay, so in terms of um, contracts and how that's going to work, I think this broadly covers it. We're looking to share a copy of the specification by the end of September, we're still working through that. We're hoping to share that with everybody that will be available on our website and then hopefully you will be able to get an idea in terms of what the specification is going to require, what services will be available and how we're looking to structure the agreements as well. Okay, so next slide please. Over to you Ethan. If you can talk us through the, the future events and the supply survey, please. Yeah, no problem. Um, so we've got a few events coming up for Tech Services 4, which will 
be our kind of last market engagement events. Um, we've got our how to bid supplier event on the 19th in London from 10 to half 12. So this will look at the um, bidding process for TS4 and we'll have a talk from our procurement operations team as well. Um, the, the spaces on this are really running out quickly. There's only a few left as of this morning. So as soon as you get these slides, please do head over to there if you want to like, follow the link, if, if you want to attend the event and register. Um, in terms of our supplier survey, uh, we've published an anonymous survey to help us understand the potential numbers of bidders for tech services for. So this is really important for um, for CCS because it will help us internally to know what to expect from tech services for and help us to um, allocate resources appropriately. So please do um, fill this out if you haven't already. It's once per organization and all you have to do is, is click which lots you're planning to apply for. It has no impact on your bid. It's completely anonymous. It's just to help us gather, gather numbers. Um, in terms of the previous supplier surgeries we've been doing with Tech UK. Once these slides are shared, you can use that link to watch them on online. Um, they're full recordings that go through the specification, the um, rate card, evaluation, all of those good topics. Um, so they're good, valuable piece of information to, to look at. Uh, in terms of our upcoming supplier surgeries, we've got two left which will be at some point in October. We did plan to have them at the end of September, but unfortunately we've had to um, slightly delay them till next month. So hopefully we'll be looking at um, coppers in more detail. We'll be looking at call-off mechanisms and terms and conditions. So um, keep an eye out on the Tech UK website and the CCS events page for, for, these, um, for the sign-up links for these events. And uh, the final thing to mention is one-to-one -one sessions. We're more than happy to have one-to-one -one sessions with any supplier who may want, want them to talk through any area of TS4. Um, we've already done quite a lot of sessions and most suppliers have found them very helpful and they're very helpful for us as well to hear your feedback. So if that's something you're interested in, please email me at ethan.harrison at crowncommercial.gov.uk and we'll get something set up. Thank you, Ethan. Um, and I just wanted to add that CODPAs are certificates of technical and professional ability. And so we keep using those kind of abbreviations. And um, I appreciate that not everybody might be familiar with those. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Agony. Ethan. there's so much information in there. I, 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 you know, I was coming in q and I've been really absolutely hugely impressed with the level of market engagement so far. It's been unprecedented. You've set an extraordinarily high bar, I have to say. So thank you so much for that. I, I, ideally, this is going to reduce <coughs> the number of um, customer questions that you'll get or you know, um, clarification questions you get during the ITT. But then again, I wouldn't I wouldn't hold my hopes up for that. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you so much for that. That was honestly was huge information, very informative. Danny, I think we've got another poll there to launch. Okay, have you completed the supplier survey? Please select one of the following, yes or no. So about 80 to 70 percent voted so please do let us know your intentions on this okay i'll give it a couple of more seconds and then we'll crack on because of timing okay danny do you want to close that and publish the results thank you so pretty much in line with the people that have decided whether uh, whether whether on the framework or not so it would be really great if you could complete that supplier survey once even if you know you're making a decision um soon we, to, to help ccs there uh as i said it'd be really really helpful if you could do that so thank you very much for helping us out there so i will we can close that down now and i'll crack on right so where we go here we are Okay, so a few top tips from us and what you should be doing now um, when it opens, okay? So first of all, um, 
if you haven't got the senior pipeline, um, I really would be taking about whether you know this this and some go back and look at the other market engagements, work out whether what you're offering is suitable. Now, if you're a SaaS provider, I would probably say this is not suitable because it's IT services. We get a lot of questions around that. Um, unless you have um, a very large amount of professional services you offer around your SaaS platform, then maybe have a chat to us about it and we'll talk you through whether we think it'd be suitable for you or not. Um, do you have people ready to apply when it arrives? There's a 30 day timeline. So it's going to be quite busy in, in October, October, November. So again, don't wait till the last minute and scramble and, and fail because there is going to be stuff that you're going to need to be doing. Um, familiarize yourself with what the application process includes. So there's the background questions, which is what's called the supplier questionnaire, which is the qualification stuff. Plus then there's the quality stuff that um, we're around, um, you know, the types of services you offer and how you go about often. This is the scored things that all, um, you know, how well your quality we received, okay? And if you're not sure, then please do consider to, uh, support if you don't have the time to apply effectively. Um, doing now, I mean, again, understand the framework requirements, have you engaged the supply engagement sessions? You know, these are really, really useful to everybody. Making sure you get your accreditations lined up, your relevant experience, consider social value. This will be part of the framework. It always has to be now under the under PPN uh, 0620. Um, so, you know, getting your carbon reduction plan together and making sure your prompt payment, for the, depending on the size you are, the prompt payment um, things are in order, all right? Making sure you're checking your pricing to help to, to help get into the DDAC job families. And it was great to see the, um, the things of cyber and project management added in there as well. That's really very, very useful, I think. Um, again, checking your compliance for the legal and financial requirements. I've got a couple of questions for Crown Commercial on that when we come to the Q&A. And, you know, follow the submission guidelines. <laughs> Yeah, the amount of times that we've had, you know, people don't answer the question or don't know, it really is something. Just really take your time to read through the ITC when it comes out. If you're going to go direct and make sure that you follow exactly how you're supposed to do things, because it can get a bit messy if you don't. Um, again, being successful on here, getting this is just a start. You need to be proactive. You need to build relationships with public sector. Buyers need to know who you are, especially if you're going for some of the larger questions. Don't sit there and think it's a source of inbound leads. You know, um, I get tired of hearing people say, I've been on this framework for 10 years, I've never had an inbound lead. You're like, well, you know, get out there and do some work, frankly. Um, so, you know, making sure you're bidding on the relevant opportunities through the framework effectively, qualify the opportunities like you would in any other. You know, that means, you know, do you know the, the, do you know the buyers, what they're asking for? You know, is it within the right envelope what you can do? Are you going to struggle to submit all the services? You know, don't waste your time. And just thinking at the other end, there's also buyers who have to evaluate your submissions for call-offs, you know, just willy-nilly, poorly um, poorly put together response to a call-off agreement is extraordinarily annoying um, from the other end, having been on the other end of these, okay? So really, really think hard whether you should be applying for things, all right? Um, and creating a, a bank of your successful and successful bids, sales and marketing strategy, other frameworks. And, you know, we talk about it with viability. There's a bunch of things that we think you, before you're entering into the public sector marketplace that you need to have covered off. And we've got a viability um, uh, evaluation tool that can help you with that, which we'll show later on. OK, so let's talk about how we can help here. OK, very briefly, you know, we will help you with a fully managed application um, during our team of experts. We have a three review process to ensure your quality, keep you on like the timelines and deadlines, uh, create, help you create a high scoring application. And we've got a huge, I mean, this is a 94 percent average quality score across the framework we work on. However, on tech services free, we have 100 percent success rate on that. And against, you know, there was a 63% across all the eight lots previously, which we see as the market success rate. This is stuff that people who uh, submitted their tenders against those were awarded. All right. So, you know, we we do a good job, I think. All right. So, you know, and across, uh, you know, so 27 perfect frames of 94.9, 95% success rate. I think it was big data and analytics that kind of skewed that one a couple of lots we didn't get. Okay, and again, a bit more detail and background of our framework successes. You know, we are very, very good at getting people on these, but also very good at helping you earn good money on, on them afterwards, making sure so we're very passionate about working with people that are purpose led and not just in it for the money. Okay, it's about doing good work and helping the public sector solve some quite big challenges that they have. 
Um, again, we talk about our viability here, so our viability assessment, which can tell you about, you know, if you're brand new to the market or looking to see, well, why aren't we being successful? It can take some of the blockers that you might be finding and how to unlock those. Um, and here again, you can book a chat with us as well. Okay, so a final poll before we hit Q&A. Here we go. How did you find this webinar? Please select one of the following. Very useful, useful, or not useful at all. And we shall publish the results shortly after that. Excellent, up to 80% already. Okay, we've got 80% though, that's pretty much everybody. Um, Danny, shall we just close that one down now so we can crack on to Q&A? Woohoo! 47% very useful, 50% useful. Thank you so much. Uh, looks like our competitors didn't get in and put their not useful usual when they put in there when they come here. But yeah, really grateful for that. Thank you so much. That helps us know that we're on the right track and doing the right job. So uh, without further ado, I think we will be hitting into Q&A if I'm not correct. Please. Uh, while Danny's preparing himself, actually, I've got a couple of questions. Um, Andy and Ethan, if you wouldn't mind. First of all, um, you mentioned in the application process that um, an organization needs to be UK registered. Can I just clarify, does that mean they need to have a company's house registration and UK VAT? Is that right? That's correct. That's the usual approach. However, I have to caveat everything that we say in here today because TPP and guidance and regulations yeah. are still coming through. So we will be releasing information as soon as we have them. But at the moment, yes, this is the approach. Fantastic, thank you. And it's good to see the stuff about rate cards that you're only asking for onshore there, but allowing for offshore, not only evaluating onshore, sorry, so I like that one. Um, just wondering about the, I mean, this is more regulation stuff here, so I'm being a bit cheeky, um, about the reopening of the frameworks in year three and year five has to be done by then. Does that actually mean that the IT, just the ITT application has to be open or it has to be actually closed and done by the end of year three and year five? It has to be done by the beginning of year three and year five. So the process will open beforehand, just like we would do with any kind of renewal. So yeah. when it comes to an open framework, um, I suppose it takes a while to get used to the idea that these are three separate frameworks that mm. will be live different periods of time, but it will be the same terms and conditions or predominantly same terms and conditions, no material changes to differences when it comes to evaluation. So with that in mind, I think hopefully it's easier to envisage how the process is going to work. We will have to have it closed and done by the beginning of the next iteration of the framework. And regardless of what happens, I suppose with the process, aside from the framework not continuing, which is not what we're looking to do, the buyers will have a guarantee of continuity of buying. So if they started on the old one, they will be able to finish as well. So yep. that's been catered to. Fantastic, that's great. Thank you so much. Right, that's enough from me. Let's, Danny, if you've got some, um, I'm sure we've got lots of questions from the um, attendees. Yeah, some coming in now. Um, as Chris said, if we don't get around to answering them, we'll try our best to get them written up and send around with the wash up afterwards. Um, some asks, is it possible to apply for multiple lots, uh, e.g. lot 3 lot, and 3A, lot 4, 4A, four etc.? Yes, absolutely. So when it comes to the evaluation process, and I'll try to keep it without visuals, and I am a very visual person, I think, like a lot of other people would be. When it comes to the main lots and what we call the lower value and complexity lots, those will be exactly the same. So we will have the same specification, the same evaluation questions, but the thresholds will be different. In order to make sure that the process is streamlined for the suppliers and therefore the suppliers would not have to bid twice, the process that we are looking to introduce is that if you want to be on both lots, you need to tell us up front and therefore if you were to qualify on the main lot, you could automatically be added to the smaller, the lower value and complexity lot. You wouldn't have to bid twice. However, this process would not work in reverse because the lower value and complexity lots would have a lower quality threshold. So for the suppliers that perhaps will not be able to get onto the main lot, they could still get onto the smaller lot or the lower value and complexity lot. Can you tell that we haven't really landed on what we exactly going to call them? Um, but yes, this is, this is the kind of idea. Streamlining the process, 
making sure that the suppliers won't have to bid twice and that we will incorporate into the process the supplier's ability to tell us whether they want to be just on one or all two. That's fantastic, thank you. Yeah. Um, another question in here um, that I think could go to both of you more for the technical and Chris, your opinions on on this about SMEs on the framework, but is there a minimum turnover for an SME or a company to get onto the framework, but also what are your thoughts um, with SMEs and, and, and size of SMEs and their success with the framework? Chris, do you want me to start? You first, Aggie, yeah. So I suppose we, we have been using the, the known definition of an SME. And this is largely based on self-declaration as well when it comes to suppliers. So when it comes to the technology services for uh, the lower value and complexity lots are not going to be SME only lots. I just need to make that very clear. So the lower value and complexity lots is meant to lower the barriers to entry for suppliers that otherwise perhaps would not be able to get onto the framework. Frameworks unlike what DPS is or you know what you what will be sorry dynamic markets will have a high level of due diligence so we will have to deploy the due diligence and the checks up front to guarantee that the suppliers are capable they have the right technical abilities and capabilities etc with that in mind we also need to ensure we will have an obligation to lower barriers to entry for smes so that's that's what we're looking at doing I think at the moment we have a really good representation of SME base on Technology Services 3, as we've mentioned before. So we're really hoping that this will be also the case on Technology Services 4. Thanks, Aggie. Um, I think from my perspective, um, this is, I would say this is 100% not um, CCS's view, okay? Is the, I'm talking, we, we, we focus very much on how people are successful on here. So if you're talking about applying for the framework, um, have at it. I think there are, there are no matter your size. I would be I would be cautious though because frameworks really ought to be used for in practice for anything that's a below threshold contract. Right? There's other routes to market for those. They do in process, but this sort of size framework probably not. So if you think that the thresholds are 100k ish for central government and 200k total contract over for wider framework. Now for for wider public sector, so the risk risk process for a buyer that is three times that value. All right, so you really ought to be turning over um, before a buyer will look at you even um, as part of their due diligence around 600K. Okay, and that's the minimum. So, but to be successful, I would suggest, and this is being, you can get it's not the application process, by the way. This is to being successful on the framework and actually making it worth your while being on there. I would say that micro is probably on, it's not for them. There are other routes to market for them. And then potentially if you're an SME, I would suggest that you want to be at least a one to two million pounds in turnover just to enable buyers um, risk profile when doing that. And again, I would absolutely stress that this is my own personal opinion and not Crown Commercial's policy or anything else like that. It's from a practical perspective of having bought from the framework, but also having helped people buy and sell through it as well. OK. Next question. Um, one question here, I'm not sure if we've already answered this, sorry, I'm, I'm losing track, but um, there are rumours going around um, about the Procurement Act being delayed, possibly till February. If this was the case, would this mean that TS4 would go with it? Well, there's plenty of rumours, I think, circling at the moment when it comes to a lot of things TPP related, and that's probably the latest. So I'm hoping that if there is going to be a delay that we will be notified as soon as possible um, we are intending for technology services for to be launched under the new procurement regulations so we will have to delay the ITT go live as well if there is a delay to the go live date so yes we are very much dependent on the go live date okay i think i think the the, the main issues that you've got here is around the supply registration service so you would be using the new uh, cdp for the, so the digital platform or be sticking to jagger for this i suppose you have good cdp won't it okay. there's a lot of work happening in the background so we will need to be able to interface and i think it hasn't been yet fully explored exactly 
how these things would need to work because if it goes live and therefore we need to deploy the process but well, i think again for the uh, procurement act to go live there's a really big dependency on the central digital platform to work yeah. and have all of those things in place so it's a bit of a chicken and egg kind of a issue i'm afraid and i don't think unfortunately that we have a, an answer to this today chris no, but I think you've been fairly uh, open there, Aggie, again, your transparency through this whole thing has been absolutely phenomenal. So, you know, uh, if you look at, anyone anyway, says, right, the, the thing's going to move, you, you know, you want to go live the day after pretty much, launch the ITT the day after TPA goes live. Um, and, you know, if it moves to shift February, then it moves to February. So I, I can't imagine you want to change your deadlines around that. So that was a good question, though. Um, next one, Danny. Um, yeah, so there's a few questions coming in around certifications, um, normally around um, is there any um, confirmation of what certifications are need, i.e. the ISO 27001, um, and will there be cyber essentials um, equivalents allowed, or that sort of thing, so is there any clarification around certs? It just so happens that we've done a full um supplier surgery session just a couple of weeks ago on certification standards uh the certificates of uh, technical and professional ability so um there is no short or brief answer to this question i'm afraid there is a list there's conditions in terms of oh we've listed all of that so i would highly and strongly recommend you having a look and watching the session we are looking to revisit that as well just to provide the, the final confirmation of what it is that we will be asking the suppliers to provide. But we have also split those requirements into the main lots and lower value and complexity lots. So you would see that there's a difference. So for example, when it comes to certification, and we will be asking for suppliers to provide a number of certificates, um, all of them would have to be internationally recognizable as part of the new regulations. When it comes to cyber essentials, we it's a PPN. So it's a regulation that we will have to ask the suppliers to provide that at the moment there's no equivalent allowable as far as we're concerned uh, unless it changes so when it comes to certification uh, for the main lots we will be asking all suppliers to provide a copy of the certificates or evidence of certification uh, prior to the framework going live so prior to signature pretty much when it comes to the lower value and complexity lots we'll be asking the suppliers to provide evidence of certification or equivalence within the first 12 months post go live of the framework or prior to a call of go live whichever comes first so this is a kind of approach we've taken but again uh, please do have a look at the recording there's a lot more information there's a full pack available as well with sides detailing exactly what it is that we will be asking for and when it will come in force that's excellent, Aggie. Thank you. I suppose the other one that I've got from that is, do we know the insurance, with the insurance levels mentioned on that for the liabilities like public and private, and, uh, public and professional indemnities plus, plus employers? Uh, we haven't released that yet, but we're not looking to do anything controversial. Um, that's, that's what I'm going to say. We're going to stick with the kind of standard <laughs> approach, I think, and make sure. <laughs> We're looking to be reasonable. Um, I think that's that's all I can say at the moment. Okay, you'll have a lot of suppliers chasing you if that comes out with 10 million. I'm joking, by the way. Danny, not on my list, Chris. <laughs> Um, actually, I think we're at time now. We're, we're pretty much at time. So I just wanted to, uh, any other questions that we've got there, we'll get, we'll do our best to get answered and making sure CCS are happy with our answers or ask them to do them ourselves. Um, and we'll get everything out with any luck to run. Well, thank you everybody for their attendance today. But I think huge thanks to, um, to well, Danny sort of helping, but also to, to Aggie and Ethan for not just today, but all of the work they've done previously on this and the work still to come. So. Um, Huge thanks to you both. Thank you very, very much. And, uh, you know, I, I, I look forward to seeing you on the 19th again, but also, um, you know, for, for keeping going all the stuff you're doing so far. So it's much appreciated. And as I said, you set an extraordinarily high bar this time. Our oh, pleasure. And thank you very much for having us. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Well, in that case, we're going to go down and crack on. And uh, I wish you all the best for the future of this one. Any questions, just give us a shout and we'll see what we can do to help you. Again, thanks, CCS. And, um, Thanks, Danny, for all the work you've done on getting this edited as well. Cheers, everybody. Bye for now.